Good afternoon. We are so glad that you're with us today um, for this presentation on self-care for parents. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sarah Becker over at um, the Kickapoo Tribal Health Center Behavioral um, Health Program, and she'll give you a bit of information about why we're here and who we can thank for being here today. Sarah? Thanks, Marnie. My name is uh, Trey Holland, we're on the Native Connections Grant, which is a suicide and substance abuse prevention grant for 12 to 24 year olds. Um, we are so glad that you guys are joining us today, uh, whether live or watching the recording, we just appreciate you taking the time to really just invest in yourself and practice some self care. Um, I want to thank you guys for taking some time to get to know Marnie and Maureen and all the wonderful things that they're going to be providing to you guys today. If you have any questions about today or questions about behavioral health services or substance abuse services, just give us a call 405-964-2618 and we will get you guys helped out however we can. Sarah, thank you so much for that introduction. And Maureen and I wanna point out how forward thinking um, that, that Sarah and Trey's organization is and how forward thinking Kickapoo Tribal Health Center is because what we are seeing is that the field is only now just recognizing that parents are one of the most un underserved populations post pand maybe in general, but certainly post pandemic. Attention has been paid, paid to so many other people and not so much to parents. And that shift is happening. There is more attention being put on the needs of parents, but um, you are really the, fr the front runners there on doing this. So thank you very much for being so forward thinking and giving us this opportunity to present some information about self-care for parents. Um, where we really wanted to start, and you know, Maureen named this coming out of the darkness. And what I wanna be really clear about is those words are very intentional. She didn't say coming into the light. We know that this is a transition time. And a transition time means that this wasn't a light switch that went off and on. Um, there is maybe, there are maybe moments you see the light, moments you don't see the light, moments you forgot where to even look for the light. And so this is, we are going to acknowledge this is a transitional time, both for you and for your families. And which is why self-care, supporting yourself right now and helping your family support themselves is so important because change is hard. And even though it's nice to be starting to look at the backside of a pandemic, it means change for all of us and change isn't easy. So um, before we get too deep in, I wanna give a little bit of introduction so you know who we are. Um, Maureen Underwood, who is our featured speaker today is a licensed clinical social worker. Thanks Maureen. Um, Maureen has been working in the field of youth suicide prevention for more than 35 years. It's really kind of more than 40, right Maureen? <laughs> It's closer um, to 50, but we're not going to, we're not going to go <laughs> We just like to use a little creative numbers there. But so she's been in that field for a long time. She also has a special, a practice specialty in trauma and grief. And she brings to the experience of this pandemic, having worked in many large scale national and regional traumatic events like September 11th. So although none of us have experience of having been through a pandemic, Maureen has had a great deal of experience in larger scale traumatic events. And she brings that experience to um, what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, also, Maureen has worked for the Department of Mental Health in Oklahoma for more than nine years. And before the pandemic, she was spending so much time, not in her home in Dallas, but in, in, in hotels in Oklahoma, that many people would have said that her home base was Oklahoma, not Dallas. Um, so that's Maureen. Um, I, I'm Marnie Rhoda. I started working with Maureen after September 11th and um, have continued to work with her over the years on um, events such as September 11th and working and supporting families during hard times. So that is who we are. Maureen, I'm gonna let you hop in here and talk a little bit about how we're using a prevention lens today. Thanks, Marnie. And I wanna just say thank you all for taking the time to listen to this. 
Um, you know, Marnie is honest. I sort of feel like Oklahoma is my adopted state. So it always, it always feels good to be doing something for you all. Um, I want to set the stage for the approach that we're going to be taking to self-care. And we're going to be using the lens of prevention. Good prevention of any kind has at its core identifying a problem and then finding the best solutions. So taking care of ourselves is the first step in taking care of our families. And it's in just another kind of prevention mechanism that we want you to kind of have that, that definition of figuring out what the problem is so you can figure out what to do about it and prevent it from happening again. So that's the, the perspective that we're gonna take on this. And how we're gonna talk about this, the first step um, in self-care and prevention in we're going to use is to, you know, really understanding what you're up against. And the definition that we're using is, is really stress. Um, you know, seeing that um, as particularly as it relates to the pandemic, which certainly has colored and it still colors our worlds. I mean, I'd love to say it's over, but we may be in the beginning of the end, but it's it's just not over. So we're using that as the foundation for self-care. And we're going to draw some connections to the activities that you need to do for yourselves and what you need to do for your kids. Um, you know, those of um, us in social work often talk about what we call The things you need in, in just a slightly different way are some of the things that your kids need as well. So Marnie, I'm going to turn this over to you to talk a little bit about one of the tools we've developed to help you with this. Absolutely. So we didn't want to just spend 45 minutes with you talking at you and then say, you know, good luck with that. Um, we put together a workbook that accompanies today's um, presentation. And the idea we have about this workbook is that it's really part two of this workshop. So the workbook is a supplement and it's a part two. We'll reference it throughout um, our talk today. But what we would love for you to do is use it afterwards to take a look at, to refresh your memory of what we talked about. And then, and this is a key part because we know as parents, you're concerned about your children. And that's one of the reasons why you're here today is you wanna find out how to help your children as well. And so my recommendation about this is work through the whole workbook for yourself. Then go back, sit with your child, go through it with them. Not just to get their answers though, start by, asking, by sharing with them what you wrote down. Share your experiences, share what your stressors were, share what your problem solving skills are because that's really how they're going to learn. Model it for them, show them, and then after you've shared your information, you can ask them theirs. You're much more likely to get some honest information from them when you do it like that. So that's how we suggest you use today's workbook. Um, we hope you find it a useful tool. And Maureen, I'm gonna let you kind of get us started. Okay, I'm gonna get us started by talking really about the post pandemic state of the world. Um, you know, our attention has shifted from where it was at the beginning of the pandemic a little over a year ago, and it's kind of moved to, you know, where we are right now. And the initial advice, if you remember back then, was how do we talk to our kids about illness, how you had to cope with, you know, all the distress that came from COVID-related illness. There was the loss of social connections, those hybrid learning experiences. Now, the focus kind of nationally seems to have shifted to how to help youth readjust to school when they start in September after having such a heavily disrupted year. Um, and as Marnie said at the beginning, finally, and this is really something that just has actually happened in some of the, the things that have been published this month, the conversation has shifted to the well-being of parents and other caregivers. Um, studies are coming out 
that are calling attention to the mental health needs of all of us who care for children. And this is crucial because there's really a direct link between our well being as a parent or a caregiver and that of our kids. And we want to just kind of acknowledge right up front that we know that you all may be in very different positions as parents. Some of you may be caring not just for your children, but you may be caring for your aging parents as well, or you may be caring for your grandchildren. Um, as someone who spent surprisingly more time with my grandchildren in the last year, um, I understand what that caring for is like. Um, some of you may be grieving the death of loved ones, and we really want to both acknowledge your loss, and I don't know that there are words to say how sad we are that you've had to experience that. Loss, and you've got some... that's the tip of the iceberg and we know that. Obviously we can't provide answers to all these challenges in 45 minutes. Um, even if we had all day, we couldn't provide answers to these challenges or maybe even all week to be honest. But we hope we can give you some places to start and can Hey, Maureen, I'm going to suggest that you turn off your video and just use your audio because you are freezing. Okay. So let's just turn off your video and see if that helps. All right. Thanks. So let's see if that's any better. Yep. So far, so good. Um, Keep going. You know, yeah, you don't need to see my picture, truthfully. You've heard how many years I've been around. You don't need to see my picture. Um, so when we talk about the context that we use this in is we talk about stress. Um, and the definition that we're using of stress is really we're talking about how your body reacts to a real or a perceived demand or threat. And it's really important to look at those words real or perceived, because again, stress is a very individual concept. What's stressful for you may not be stressful for me. What's stressful for, for me may not be stressful for you. So it's, it's a very different thing to different people. Um, some people handle stress better than others. And, and not all stress is bad, especially in small doses, stress can help us get things done. Um, our bodies are really designed to handle small amounts of stress, but those physiological, emotional, and behavioral reactions that come from our biology get really messed up when we're facing chronic stress, um, which is kind of when bad things seem to be happening all the time. And we'll give you a definition of that. As we said before, we want to explain to you what we're talking about. And you know, one of the things that we say all the time is a problem well-defined is a problem half solved. So the definition we're going to use of stress, which is on our next slide, is we're going to, going to talk about two kinds of stress. We're going to talk about acute stress and chronic stress. And since you don't have my picture, you can imagine that's me with my chronic stress looking at all of you. Acute stress um, is useful stress. And this is the short-term stress that goes away very quickly. When you're driving down the highway, for example, and the person in front of you slams on their brakes and you slam on your brakes and you feel your, either your heart goes to your stomach or your stomach goes to your heart, something happens, that's an acute stressor. It helps you manage a dangerous situation. It also occurs when you do something that's new or exciting. And you know, I'm gonna steal some of Marnie's thunder because when we asked you all some things that you had done or learned during the pandemic, we had one of you who learned to be a bungee. Of this acute stress at one time or another. Chronic stress. This is stress that goes on for a longer period of time, goes on for weeks or months. And what we could say about COVID, it's created chronic stress for all of us. And the problem is we become so used to it, we don't even know that it's a problem. And if we don't find ways to manage it, 
it really can lead to problems with our health. It's like that app that's constantly running in the background, sucking away your energy. Um, and that's why it causes a problem. And we wanted to just kind of give you a very brief biology lesson. Um, you know, and this is a lesson that has worked for me, and I'm not a, a biology major. What we know is when we have stress in the external world, it's also in our brains. And what happens in our brains when we're under stress, this biochemical cortisol is released. And this impairs what's called the limbic system of our brain. And the reason it's important to understand this, the limbic system is the learning center of the brain. So you can see why when your kids are under chronic stress, it's hard for them to concentrate and learn in school because this just impairs their ability to concentrate, to have memory, um, to make good decisions. But what we know at the very same time we have this cortisol kind of popping up in our brain, we also have something that's called oxytocin. And this is a brain chemical that comes from supportive relationships, our connections with others, and it takes away some of those negative impacts of that cortisol and helps normalize our brain architecture. We talk about this as feeding or nourishing our brains. And I want you to remember what I just said. It's about simply having supportive relationships. And because we think that this is so important, we're giving you um, in your workbook, there's actually a little section that talks about ways to nourish your brain. And, and when I say that this is simple, it is so simple. I mean, we just told you that oxytocin you get from having supportive relationships. You also get it when you pet your dog. Um, you get some serotonin when you eat a piece of chocolate. So we want you to, we've given you suggestions that you can take a look at because this is the food for your brain that helps counteract some of that chronic stress. And we know that some of that stress has also had an impact on your parenting. Um, we ask, we do these programs a lot all around the country. And so we've asked other parents um, to report to us, you know, what the impact of pandemic has been on their particularly parent skills. And a lot of people have reported that it's just so much more exhausting than usual. It just takes more energy. And again, when you think of that app running in the background, you understand why you're exhausted. Um, in some families, it gave people time to get to know each other better. Sometimes that was good. Mm, sometimes that was not so good. And you had no place to escape. Um, so often you got on each other's nerves because um, there wasn't some other place to take it out. Many, many parents just couldn't say enough about how much they have revalued education. Um, they understand why they never went into the career of teaching because they're terrible at it. And they really understand how hard school is for their kids. And a great many folks were sad for their thing, the things that their kids missed out on. Um, even simple things like having overnights or school concerts were things that were really sad to them. And so that's the stuff that kind of they've lived through. And I wonder, Marnie, if you can tell us a little bit about what it's like coming out of the pandemic. Absolutely. And so just to be clear, see, it's a, you see, you see this is a transitional slide again. I want to be clear that we know this isn't a flipping of the switch. And we know that you probably, maybe you're one of them. Some people are racing back to life as it was before. Some people are tipping, tipping their, their feet in the water and they're not sure what they want. And you know, some people are like reevaluating. Do they want to go back to the way things were? Or are they looking to create something different for themselves? So it doesn't matter where you are in that. All of those places are appropriate and good places to to be. What I want to address here is what about what to do if it's just hard for you and your family to make this transition? What if you're struggling with this transition itself? And what I want to do is I want to validate for you that that's normal and okay. Psychologists call it re-entry fear and it's a real thing. You know, it's a fact that it's easier to learn to be afraid 
than, it's, than it is to learn to be unafraid. And that's really our brains protecting us. We are, we are hardwired to survive and protect ourselves. So fear gets learned very quickly. Losing fear takes more time. And so if you're in that boat right now, or your family is in that boat right now where um, you're not sure and you're still feeling anxious, one, that's okay. And two, just a couple little simple tips. The first thing I wanna say is that something that you can do to start to help yourself make a transition is to rehearse what it is you wanna do. So for instance, if you're not so sure you wanna do something, don't decide you're gonna do it. Decide you're just gonna go kind of practice it or rehearse it. This could be useful for your students, your children too, who might not want to um, go back to school or go to see whatever it is they, they, that anyone's afraid of, to rehearse it. What that can do, that just going to the place, for me, it was going back to my gym. I didn't think I wanted to go back. Then I walked in just to drop something off. As soon as I was in the building, my muscle, my brain's muscle memory of the, why I liked going there just kind of turned on and it became something that I didn't think I would ever do became something I wanted to do. So, and it wasn't, I didn't go to work out. I just went to walk in the building. And so I really want to make it that simple for you. Don't force yourself to do scary things if it's too hard. Tell yourself, I'm just going to rehearse it. I'm just going to check it out. I'm just going to drive by that place. I'm just going to like step in, do something like that and, and, see, and see if that helps you, see if it helps someone else. But also I just wanna say, give yourself time. Whatever time this takes you is the right amount of time to make the change. And while you're doing that, again, you don't necessarily need to go back to all the things you were doing before. You've had, many of you have had a pause. It's a good time to reevaluate what things you were doing before that maybe don't serve you anymore and you want to replace them for some, with something else. You can look around and do that as well. So that is really um, talking about the fact that, again, I, I feel like all my slides are about change and transition. Um, this, you know, what we acknowledge is you're changing course. Um, and sometimes, you know, if you look around and you think you, if you don't change your direction, you're going to wind up, um, you're going to wind up where you're headed and maybe where you're headed isn't where you want to go. Um, and so what I really want to talk about when we talk about changing course um, is I'm going to kind of stretch this now to another idea. As parents, your course, your true north is take care of family, take care of family, take care of family. And whether that's your children or your elderly, um, elderly parents, it's your course is oftentimes your true north is always take care of, take care of somebody else. And one of the changing courses that we want to emphasize is take care of self, then you can take care of family. Sometimes we have a slide here about putting your oxygen mask on first. That's an expression that gets used all the time. You know, what I want to remind you is, is how true that is. If you don't put your oxygen mask on first and you try to put the oxygen mask on all the other people who you care about around you, you might run out of air before you get to do all, take care of all those people and yourself. So the course change we want, we're talking about today, even as we give you all of these tips for you um, and why we're doing that and that you can use them for your families. But what we wanna tell you is please take care of yourself first and please make um, this post pandemic transition about what you need. So um, that being said, one of the ways one of the ways that we think is really useful to look at what you need um, is to say, well, what have you done? Before we look forward, let's look back and let's talk about shifting the story of the pandemic. So we asked all of you when you registered, what are some things that you're proud of? And we got what I would say is a mind blowing list. And so I'm gonna read them. Maureen already mentioned our bungee instructor, which is incredibly, exciting and impressive, but I'm going to read them because I think they all deserve a moment of time because it, they're huge accomplishments um, and it really can help you start to look at whether you have something on this list or you don't and you can add your own things to it, really start to look at what you're proud of that's happened. This whole, this pandemic was probably not all bad news for people. So here's some ideas. More self-care, took some of the extra time to take care of yourself, completed tasks you've been avoiding, 
kudos to that. I found like I avoided more tasks somehow during the pandemic. You survived a school year. That's that in of itself is amazing. Um, got certified as a health and life coach. Got out there exercising. That bungee instructor. Um, lost my father after opening my own barber shop with five kids and a husband. Hasn't been easy. I guess not to even just keep going. But I have, and the barber shop has been a success. So that's. That's a lot, that's like climbing a mountain with like 500 pounds in your back. So amazing. Um, the success my kids made by passing and moving to the next grade, we made it. And I love, I kept the we made it in there because it's so, I feel that energy completely. Got married, got a promotion. I mean, holy cow, that there are some ideas here about ways to rewrite the last year. And you know what, that whole coming out of the darkness analogy, maybe you can start to shift that and that doesn't even fit for you because there's this wasn't all a dark time. So Maureen, I'm going to let, it, let you come back on and talk about some, all that being said, shifting your perspective is great, but there's some other really good strategies for, for reducing stress, right Maureen? Absolutely. And again, these are very simple. We just looked at that amazing physiological impact that support can have on your brain. Well, there are two other really simple ways that can help us manage our stress. Um, and they include figuring out what we can control, which usually involves giving ourselves some structure. So let's talk a little bit more about these three key ingredients in self-care. And we do say magic words because they just work all the time. Um, the, we'll talk about, first of all, what the word support means to you. Um, and what we wanted to do um, as a way to kind of reinforce that. And we ask you to kind of do a lot of reflection about this, but we wanted to start by asking you where you got your support when you were growing up. Now, you may think it's kind of strange that we're asking you to go back to your childhood, but one of the things we know from our brain biology is that good memories stimulate serotonin production, which in, is another one of those brain chemicals that makes us feel good. So here's this list of questions, and we have these all in the workbook for you, so you can spend some time thinking about them, you know, whether it was your family, a person in particular, a teacher, a friend, a story that you can remember that made you smile, something about your faith that's been sustaining, what your cultural heritage gives to you. Um, have you ever noticed on TV shows or videos people who are sitting around and talking about silly memories? They're all laughing and how one good memory, somebody says, oh, that makes me think about something else. And you can see that that's all the positive energy that comes from memories. Even if our childhood wasn't filled with happy memories, most of us can remember at least one instance when someone or something made us feel good about ourselves. If it wasn't a person, maybe it was a pet, or maybe it was going to visit a special place that touched our hearts, okay? When we remember that, we give ourselves a burst of serotonin. Try it. Even if that good memory lasts for only a few minutes, you wanna cultivate it and use others to kind of review in times when you're feeling really stressed. Give yourself a minute to have one of those pauses and think about one of those stories, one of those memories that makes you feel good, especially when it comes to support. We also wanted to give you some clues about how to support yourself. And the first thing that we wanted to say was really a lot of us parent based on fears, um, you know, and especially with the pandemic, there was a whole lot more fear based parenting. Um, it, we were worried our kids were going to get sick, our kids were not going to do well in school. And remember what Marnie said to you, that it's easier to learn to be afraid than it is to be not afraid. So you have to be conscious and intentional to give up that fear. Um, look in your workbook, because we ask you to make a list of some of the post-pandemic parenting things that scare you and then take a look at them one by one. And what we want to suggest to you when you look at them one by one is to use those three magic words 
I just suggested. Support, control, and structure and apply them to your fear. For example, you may be worried your child will be around someone who gives them COVID. Okay, say that happens. You get support from your physician, you get probably hopefully support from the school, and you get a plan, which is the structure about how to care for your child so you get back in control of their health. You see how that works? You're just taking those principles and applying them to the things you're scared of. You also family and your community over the last year. Again, most of us are pretty good at listing the things we missed out on or lost, but what are the things you gained? What did they teach you about yourself? How did you grow? What do you still need to work on? Remember, we're all works in progress. We may just need a little help figuring out how we're gonna grow. The next thing on here you see is about counteracting helplessness with helpfulness. When we feel helpless, we feel out of control. There's that word again. So doing something to help somebody else, no matter how small, gives us that brain boost that lifts our mood a little. Think of the kind things people do to help someone else. Yes, it makes that other person feel good, but in return, you get a brain boost too. It works both ways. And finally, it's remembering that asking for help takes courage. It's a brave thing to do, and you all have done it. You do brave things all the time, you just may not realize. You go to the dentist, I personally think that's very brave. Um, you ask for directions from strangers when you're lost. Make a list of the things you've done in the last few months that took courage, like getting vaccinated perhaps, and give yourself courage and credit for being stronger and braver than you probably realized. The last piece we wanna emphasize in terms of this controlling is the whole idea of control to get through chronic stress. In your workbook, you're gonna see questions like, in my current life, what can I control? What can I add to that list? For many of us, control may seem like it's a bad word. Who wants to be controlled? We agree, being controlled is no fun. But having control, oh, what a difference that makes. The pandemic felt like it was controlling almost everything we did for over a year, didn't it? And in truth, it really did give us a run for our money. Um, we may not have noticed in the midst of it, there were things that we controlled. Like what you're saying? Well, every decision you made carried a certain degree of control. What time you got up, what your family ate or didn't eat for dinner, um, how you reinforced or didn't reinforce wearing masks. We go through life making hundreds of small decisions every day, but we tend to focus more on the ones we can't control than on the ones we can. And we're sure you've heard that wise old saying, when you can't always control what happens to you, you can always control how you respond. Finally, we're gonna take a look at that structure, that third magic word component. Um, and in your workbook, we ask you the question to come up with at least three ways or five ways, I think we even ask you to add structure to your life. Um, structure provides you with control. And it looks like the routines and the boundaries you have. It's the way you organize your time, like wearing a watch, for example, gives your life some structure. Um, or when you've cleaned a kitchen cupboard or cabinet, you feel good. You feel like you're in control, whatever the mess was before you gave it some organization and structure. It may seem like it's too simple, but it really is. Think of the places in your life where you find structure. It's the comfort of familiarity. Your church or the place where you worship. The grocery store is very structured. You know what aisles to go down to what, get what things. A doctor's office, you know the procedure when you go and sign in and how long you're going to sit and wait and all the rest of that. And my favorite, malls. You could be placed in any mall in the world and you would feel like you're at home because they're all the same. 
they're structured the same way. Um, and when you have structure, either through that place you're at or that time that your watch gives you, there's one less thing in the world you have to worry about. And I think, Marnie, you want to add something to this for us? I do. So I want to talk for a minute about um, structuring. You know, one of the ways we can add structure to our life is structuring our days. We can make a list for ourselves. We can decide we're going to wake up 30 minutes before we normally do to take a walk outside or to have a cup of coffee in the peace and quiet of our house. So we can add structure by adding some things to our days. Um, what I want to mention about this is that that's the kind of thing that when you're feeling a little lost and out of control, we can all tend to overstructure. We overcompensate. We think to ourselves, I need to add some structure to my day. So I'm going to wake up 30 minutes early. I'm going to fit in time for a walk after work for, you know, around the neighborhood. I'm going to, and all of a sudden you've added five structure things to your day that you don't have time for. And now you just feel terrible. So Maury and I are huge fans of the 2% rule. Don't make big changes. Don't add five things to your day to add structure. Find something you can do that's 2% more structure than you had before, which is why I said wake up a half an hour early. I didn't say wake up an hour early, which is why I gave you the option of taking a walk or having coffee, reading a book, looking out the window, whatever it is you want to do. So 2%. So when you look to add structure by adding things, some structure to your life, because when you control your schedule, it feels better, right? Um, so add structure, but please don't go all out. Don't don't go all out. Think about 2% for that. And Maureen, do you want to talk a little bit about what happens when problems pop up? Because um, even, even post-pandemic problems, daily problems still happen, don't they? Yeah, what we want to say is you can follow everything we're telling you, and you know that there's going to be some detours that come up. Uh, the road is never, it's never smooth. Um, some of us have been on that wrong way down a one-way street, I'll tell you. So here's some of the suggestions we have to help you. If you can anticipate what some of those detours are going to be, it's just looking ahead a little bit and realizing, hmm, um, you know, my kids were going to have a play date outside. I was so excited they weren't going to be in the house because I just need the house to myself and the forecast says it's going to rain. So what's my backup going to be? You don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. We still may not know where we exactly are. That's why we talked about this is coming out of the darkness. So don't get too far ahead. Stay in the present. We just don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Don't overschedule. Pay attention to that 2% rule. And focus on the behavior and well-being, especially of your children. Um, you know, we want you to look at wellness instead of problems and understand that some of your kids may be challenged by school when they go back because of all the developmental disruptions they've had. School people understand this, but if you notice them, what you want to do is talk with the school um, to see what you can do perhaps to help with ways that kids may have regressed. You want to recognize that going through this pandemic as we've said to you, you have developed skills. We all have, we made it through. Uh, and it's important to recognize the ways we can apply those. And often, sometimes what we have to do is get a helpful perspective. And the next slide kind of tells us what that looks like. And the perspective really begins with taking that deep breath. That's the pausing. Um, as you know, it's always better to take a breath and pause before you jump in um, and tackle any problem. You don't want to, on those days when everything is falling apart, feel like you have to identify and work on every problem. You want to keep them separate. As Marnie said, that's another way that you can use that 2%. And if you start in the here and now, you know, when you try to plan ahead, it kind of interferes with your reaction in the present. So you wanna to try to really kind of stay as close as you can to the present. You wanna identify what kind of problem it, that you have and what is it that makes everything else seem like it's falling apart? There's something that tipped your pile of problems over. And it's usually the one that tips it over is the easiest one to fix. So we try to go to that one first rather than looking at the whole pile and making an avalanche out of a snowball. 
that's what we call it. Um, when you're worried about everything, you can't fix anything. And it, we really can make it worse by adding all the other what ifs um, that our minds can attach to something that's not going well. And Marnie, you also wanna tell us, I think about some ways that we can take those breaths and those micro breaks. Yes, I do. So, um, and this is coming back to that 2% um, bit. Um, it's hard work being a parent. It's a hard work all the time. Um, it's often hard work that's surprisingly hard work and you feel like no one gave you the memo ahead of time that this was gonna be a 24 seven, 365, can't catch up kind of situation. So one of the things, um, cause you know, when people talk about self-care, you notice by the way, Maureen and I have not once told you to book a massage, take a day for yourself. We don't find that really helpful self-care because for most of us in our day-to-day -day lives, that those aren't feasible things that we can do regularly. We're really looking and talking to you today about things you can do regular, regularly. So that brings us to micro breaks. It's kind of like that 2% thing again. Ways to give something to yourself. When you think to yourself, oh, I need a break, right? Well, the first thing you think of you might wanna do, maybe not in the cards for you today. That doesn't mean don't do anything, right? Just cause you can't do like the first choice thing that really recharges you. Have a list of things like this that you can do easily. Brew yourself a second cup of coffee. You see, I like coffee. Sorry, I'm totally showing you my hand here. Um, brew a second cup of coffee as an afternoon treat, right? Um, do something as simple as look out the window. If you are standing in the kitchen doing something and you're just feeling it come all the top, change your position, change what you're physically looking at. The micro breaks involve your senses, shifting the sensory information you're giving to your brain. If you're looking at this, shift your focus out there, look at the window. I'm not saying like a super appreciate the grass and the trees. You can just, just shift your focus. That's all you need to do. Again, sensory information. If you're sitting, just stand up, have something sweet. We're, Maureen and I are big fans of chocolate. I put mint in here because I felt like it was a little bit less <laughs> like, but Maureen would say, um, um, have some I'd have sweet. chocolate. I yes, have chocolate. Maureen, Maureen would have an M&M or five. So yeah, so have something sweet. Again, you're changing sensory input to your mouth. Um, watch something that makes you laugh. If you don't already have a folder of things on your phone, funny memes, TikTok videos, whatever, you know, every time I turn around, my kids are wanting to show me a TikTok video. Only like 2% of them are funny to me, but those 2% that are funny to me, I keep. The rest of them, I don't even understand. But the 2% that are funny, I keep in a folder. Watch something that makes you laugh. It's again, short. You're not watching a two hour movie because you probably don't have time for that right now, but you can watch a video. Just close your eyes. I can't tell you the difference it makes. Again, you're changing your sensory input. Just you're tuning in. Close your eyes, move to a different place, or smile. Small things. And what I'll tell you as a fellow parent, when you need a micro break, there's a very good chance that this, the children in your charge need a micro break too. <laughs> Bring them along with you. You don't have to do it on the stealth. Say to them, oh, I need a break. I'm just gonna close my eyes for a minute. Do it if you want, right? Simple like that. So I'm gonna give it back to Maureen, who's got a couple other of her favorite strategies. They're a little yes. bit longer than micro breaks, but she's done some research and there's science behind these. Go ahead, Maureen. And I love them and I'm so glad Maureen always lets me put them in the presentation. First of all, you can see these wonderful people dancing. Um, and since you can't see my picture, I'll tell you, I may look like that you know, want the mustache, unfortunately. <laughs> um, dancing stimulates us physically and emotionally because there's those cognitive elements. You have to kind of be thinking of what you're doing with your feet. And there's a social element to it as well. So actually you get increased dopamine that one of those chemicals to help your brain more dopamine from dancing than you do from any other kind of exercise because you're getting the benefit of two for one. You're getting the social thing and you're getting the physical exercise. There's a lot of studies that have shown that relaxing in a warm bath helps combat depression. 
One of the things that happens when we get depressed is that our core body temperature tends to go down. So um, if you take a warm bath, now the researchers that did this talked about taking a bath in the middle of the day. I'm not sure who they are, or where they live, that they can take these baths in the middle of the day, but it as it may. But the point is it raises your body temperature and some of the results of this have been even more impressive than people who have seen serotonin increase from exercise. So the whole thing about taking warm baths or showers are really important. And finally, bright colors trigger, trigger neurological responses in the brain that cause hormones associated with happiness. Who knew? You might know that you look at someone who's dressed like this and you smile, because it's kind of strange, but what it does, bright colors such as pink, red, and yellow release dopamine that makes us feel happier. And if you have clothes on that are blue, that releases oxytocin that makes us feel calmer. So you can get a self-esteem boost simply by putting on the right colored clothes in the morning. Who knew that there could be things like this that could be so simple? So I'm going to turn it back to Marnie because I feel like that's my biggest contribution is dancing with bright colored clothes and then taking a bath. Marnie. <laughs> um, it's a great one. We are um, turning our attention now to what your what children need and how to give it to them. And, you know, we are working at kind of the end of our time together. And so you might be thinking, you know, why is it so close to the end? Well, the most, the reason it's close to the end is what, and it, you probably heard me, heard us as we went along, what your children need is the same things as you need. So when you learn to take care of yourself, when you model taking care of yourself for your children, you are teaching them what they need too. And it's easier for you to give something if you also give it to yourself because you know how to do it right. You know what works, what doesn't. You're not just reading out of a book. It says to do this. You're like, wow, you know, I find that when I'm at my wit's end, if I do this, it really helps try that. And then your kid, your child might say, that doesn't work for me, but this might. So it's the same thing. So everything we've talked about, and that's why I said, when you go through this workbook, do it for you, then do it with them, showing what you said, and then having them ch chime in. But that being said, it is the same thing. I'm going to let Maureen rehash what some of those are. Maureen? Well, we told you that there's really food and nourishment for your brain in very simple things, and we've listed them in your book. So it tells you just how you can get some of that extra boost in your brain that really nourishes you. The idea of focusing on bravery and courage, we can't emphasize this enough. Um, I think these are not words we use enough in our lives to realize how brave it is some days just to get up in the morning. Um, and, and to give ourselves credit for that. And I think to give yourself credit and to ask your kids what they're proud of. Um, I can remember asking a young girl who um, at seven, her mother had died and asking her something brave that she had done recently. And she basically said, going to school and not crying. How courageous of her. So again, these are little things. And then finally, that whole idea of support, control, and structure, those three magic words. If you look at something you're doing and you realize it's got support, control, and structure, it's gonna ease up on some of the stress that comes from what we've been living through with the pandemic. Marnie, do you have a couple other things to add to? I do. I just wanna also throw in reminders for that idea when Maureen talked about shifting our perspective Right when we when one of those detours shows up, as it will maybe as soon as today, when a detour shows up, shift your perspective, be in the moment, don't add a new problem to the pile of your worries. Look at it separately. That shift in perspective alone makes something that can be overwhelming because you've added it to a big pile to something that's very manageable and you can hold in your hand. Those micro breaks, I just talked about them. That 2%, I just talked about it. Those are all useful things for our children as well, right? Because um, having your child know that they maybe, you know, they have to go to school and it's eight hours or they have to go to camp and it's six hours and it's a long day and they can't be done till they're done, knowing that they can take a micro break in the middle of a hard task 
is important. And knowing when they set goals for themselves, don't, don't go all the way. Don't reach for the mile first. 2% changes make a big difference because when you accomplish a goal, speaking of Maureen's brain chemicals, accomplishing a goal feeds your brain dopamine. And it doesn't matter whether it's a small goal or a big goal. When you get to check off that thing on your list, dopamine, so very useful. Um, so that's what we talked about, about you and your children. But of course we know children also have unique needs. And so we want to address some very specific things we want you to know and remember um, when you, about your children. So the first thing we really wanna emphasize is that we want you to, to ask them how they're doing, ask them what's going on, then listen, even if it sounds like something they've told you a million times before, ask and then listen acknowledge what you've heard, then turn to problem solving. You know, we're parents, we just are cutting to the chase. We're like, we, as soon as the, the mouth opens, we already know what they're gonna say, we've got the answer and we go there. My request is that you slow that process down a little bit, get the information, acknowledge what you've heard, then turn to problem solving. That's gonna go a long way to helping your child begin to problem solve on their own. Don't, it's kind of like teaching, a, teaching you to fish rather than giving you a fish. When you let them go through that process with you and then turn to problem solving, because remember Maureen said like half an hour ago, a problem well-defined is a problem half, sol half solved. Letting them speak the problem, speak their fear is already getting towards the problem solving part. So you're really teaching problem solving. Also, let's have realistic expectations now more than ever. You know, I read this really interesting piece this week about recovery time this summer. And, you know, some of us are like, what? I just rested a whole pandemic. I like, did the bare minimum for all this time. How can I need more recovery time? And this article made a very, a very big distinction between rest and recovery. Recovery isn't really relaxing. It's a growth giving practice. That, follow, that should follow stressful periods and it encourages growth. The way to think about this that makes the most sense to me is if you think about if you're physically working out and anyone who does that on a regular basis or is training for something knows that a period of exertion is always followed by a period of recovery. And when your muscle grows is during the recovery, not the exertion. Recovery is essential. You don't work out seven, you don't work the same muscle seven days in a row. That's just not good physical practice. So take that to this year. We've talked about all the stress we know you were under, we know your children were under. Reduce expectations, consider that they have some recovery time. That doesn't mean no rules, do whatever you want, but it means that give them an opportunity to, you know, and call it recovery time. What can help you this summer? What can you do this summer to give yourself some recovery? Then, of course, you know, we do have to say that you want to check in with a professional if they seem too upset, too worried, too depressed. Maureen, do you want to say a little bit more about this important topic? Well, I want to say that not just for your kids, but for you as well. Suppose none of the things we've talked about here, you've tried them and they just don't work. Um, you feel like you're slipping into a depression or you're worried all the time and you can barely think how you're going to make it through the next five minutes, let alone the next day. Unfortunately, we know the pandemic has increased those really uncomfortable feelings in a lot of people. So it, it, those are not unusual responses. What do you do about them? You use those three same magic words we talked about that give your brain some relief support, control, and structure. And since you're challenged to give them to yourself, which is what we've kind of given you all these ideas, and it's like, I don't know that I could do that. You're gonna reach out to some of your local mental health resources. Please don't let the idea of counseling put you off. We know some people are reluctant to consider therapy or counseling because it makes them seem like they're crazy. They're worried about that. So if you think of it instead as going to some place to get support, control, and structure, you're going to get some food to stabilize some of those brain chemicals that are out of whack because of the chronic stress. 
And if you have members of your family who are challenged right now and struggling the same way too, explain it to them in this way. It's about getting support, construction, support control and structure and some nourishment for our brain. It's not about craziness. It's not about craziness. And that prevention perspective, again, you know, when we can recognize that we have a problem and we can do the appropriate thing to find a solution and a helpful alternative. And as we're saying right now, sometimes that alternative requires getting an objective outsider to come in and help us kind of clear the brain of cobwebs that are having us look at this in a way we can't figure it out. Um, again, think of it that way, not as something that's about illness or, you know, that you're wacky. It's just that you need to feel Excellent. So Maureen, I'm going to move us on. We you lost your voice for a minute, but I'm sure you'll come back. No, nope, that's okay. You're going to, you're yep. going to take us through the next part of this. Um, excellent. So, um, and so, uh, you know, so um, as a resource in the back of your workbook, there are three pages of amazing resources that um, you might, uh, it's in the back, you might have wanted to just maybe, maybe move it up in the front because Kickapoo Tribal Health Center has amazing resources for you there. So that is always available to you. That's a good place. But we would be remiss if we didn't share these two resources as well. They are both in your workbook, one's in the beginning, one's at the end to kind of bookend it. Um, both of these crisis lines are very are, are, are appropriate and useful for you and you, for your children. Children might prefer the texting. Um, that might be that might be more more of their conversation. You can go ahead and put these information in your phones and in your children's phones as contacts. We highly recommend that because when there is a crisis and someone is struggling, having less action steps to do to get help is very important. So go ahead, take a look at these. They're in your workbook as well. Um, put them in your phones, share them with your children so that, so that if someone needs help, they can get help right away. And I think the last thing we wanna share with you, we like to always end on a slightly lighter note. Um, um, and this, I, this is, Maureen picked this one out and I really do like this one. Um, you know, if you think you're too small to be effective, you've never been in bed with a mosquito. So we all know how bothersome that mosquito can be. And we all know how we might be feeling smaller now than we have before, because we, as Maureen said, that pandemic took over control and we started to feel like we were, had less power in our lives because there were so many things that were just being taken, cho chosen for us. And so one of the ways, as opposed to trying to stretch ourselves out bigger is to just realize you don't have to be big to make a big difference. You just have to be persistent. And you've never met anyone who's more persistent than a mosquito. So that's what I had to say. I'm Maureen, I'm gonna let you say your goodbyes. I realize I've been having trouble with the internet. So I'm just, I'm, you're gonna see me waving in your mind's eye. Um, I just wanna thank you for paying attention to this. I hope that we spoke a language that you can understand. Um, you know, Marnie and I are community folk. We don't teach in a university or some fancy setting. And so the suggestions that we come up with are pretty practical. Um, they work for us. And so we're hoping some of them will work for you too. And if they don't, you've got Sarah and Trey there for you. You got their number. They're there to help you anytime. So thank you so much and have a great summer. Thank you. Sarah and Trey, did you want to say your goodbyes as well? Feel free. I was just going to thank both of you for your time, for your expertise, for putting this together um, and making a difference in Oklahoma. Uh, and I'm, I'm partial to Oklahoma as well. Um, but I, I just want to say thank you to you guys. Thank you for everybody that's joined us today. Um, I, we are here if you need anything at all um, and taking care of yourself, knowing that you can't pour from an empty cup. So um, thank you for taking time to refill that cup. Um, as you continue to pour out for others. And if you need anything, just reach out to us. Amazing. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Trey. Have a good day, everybody. You too.